Broadcasting live from jumping straight away from a wall and into immediate death, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Seamus Connolly. And I'm your other host, Garrett Strother. And if that broadcasting location didn't immediately give away exactly what games we're doing today, we are covering the first two Uncharted video games in anticipation of the new and frankly still shocking to see Tom Holland Uncharted movie coming up in a couple weeks. Yep, so Uncharted Drake's Fortune and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. Very excited to talk about those, but we actually have, for the first time in what feels like months, more than one piece of news. Yeah, we actually do have a few things to touch on. Some some pretty exciting things going down, even just today as of recording a few hours ago, getting news, so... First up, uh, we have our look at the official uh, Oscar nominations for the 2022 Academy Awards. I saw fewer of these than I feel like I usually have. Best Picture was just a quick rundown. Belfast, Coda, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, Dune, King Richard, Licorice Pizza, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, and Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. So I saw about half of those, and I liked the ones of them I did see. It was a really weird year. I think Power of the Dog, a film I really liked, is the film that has the most Oscar nominations, 12 in total, including nods for all four of its leads. But a lot of really weird snubs like Denis Villeneuve not getting nominated for Best Director for Dune, and absolutely no nominations for Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch. Yeah, I did notice that too. French Dispatch, nowhere to be seen, even though I've heard nothing but incredible things about that movie. Unlike you, I have seen even, I mean, I've seen even less of these movies than you have. I've seen Dune, and like, that's it completely. I hope Dune sweeps the whole thing, because then I'll be like, <laughs> oh yeah, hell yeah, I loved Dune. Dune was my my thing. I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, your gushing praise of West Side Story was a, uh, was all substance because there it is up there in the best picture category that's pretty great we'll probably end up actually covering them in earnest this year because of the way our schedule's shaking out but i i certainly have a complicated relationship with them in that i do think they have uh, a significant amount of cultural importance not because they actually matter but because the culture like decides that they matter we'll talk more about that when we actually cover the oscars yeah i'm kind of in the same boat as you i always you know, in years past growing up, I always did love, you know, the Oscars are always fun. It was always like a big event back when people hosted it and stuff. Is there a host for this one? Or there still is going, going to be, but they haven't announced who it is yet. Oh, interesting. Back to form. But in other news, Futurama has been revived for the 15th time. It's Rasputin, <laughs> the show that won't die. It's coming back to Hulu. I think most shows bad bad news when they get revived by things like this but futurama has come back from the dead so many times so well i think that this probably is going to be just as good as the rest of futurama yeah i i have been a a lifelong futurama fan i think you know maybe a hot take i think maybe futurama over the simpsons i love the simpsons but futurama is so good i I think the highest highs of the simpsons are way higher than the highest highs of futurama however I do concede that there is a lot more good Futurama than there is good Simpsons. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of, and maybe it is because Futurama has been, like, short-lived, like, three different times and put together and, you know, four movies that came out in an interstitial period when they weren't technically a show, I think, and... You're kind of right in that it's consistency in its weird zombified state being, you know, Frankenstein zapped back to life every time. And much honestly, like they always make Philip J. Fry himself, Seamus. Much exactly. It's it's Futurama is its own head in a jar and <laughs> it's looking beautiful, I think. And also, every time they get canceled and come back, they always have incredible meta jokes about it. Oh, and yeah. I can't wait to see what weird Disney Hulu meta jokes they're going to throw in there. Moving on, Wii Sports is back, baby. (laughs) I get to golf in my living room again starting April 29th with Nintendo Switch Sports, which is bringing back all your favorite Wii Sports. 
I'm talking bowling. I'm talking tennis. I'm talking Kambara, which I don't know what it is, but it's there. <laughs> um, with new sports including soccer, volleyball, and badminton. Badminton, I don't understand how that's any different than tennis, but I'm glad to see it. I was going to say that. And golf is also coming in the fall with a free update. I'm pumped about this. This is uh, this is my Force Awakens as far like you know. <laughs> I mean, can, can do you remember? Do you remember all the way back when the Wii launched and the only thing you or your friend who had a Wii, the only thing they had to play was that like paper folder of Wii Sports, and it was the best damn game you ever played. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. It didn't. It didn't need a whole plastic case, Garrett. It just needed that little paper flap to just absolutely become an icon in your childhood, in your gaming history. Wii Sports, environmentally conscious king. Truly, except for the environment of swinging a controller and spider web shattering your TV. Your the <laughs> environment of your living room is not safe with Wii Sports. My friend Chris did that. Just, just yeah? right, oh. right through the screen. The golden era of America's funniest home videos when the Wii came out. Oh, the best. Oh, At wear your wrist episode. strap, kids. Wear it. You, you don't know what it means, but do it. Truly. I, that is great advice. And I think we're going to have a new wave of people sh- like shattering things with their... I mean, I guess those Joy-Cons are pretty light. Those those Wii remotes were pretty chunky back then. But... Especially if you had like the big, the big honking case on them. <laughs> Hell yeah. Or the the Wii Motion Plus, where it was like two inches longer and like a staff heavy. Well, I'm sure they're going to add in a lot more really cool. If they're adding in golf, I can imagine they'll probably do basketball was another big one for the Wii Sports Resort. I feel like they're missing some from the OG My Wii sister Sports. won't touch it, it if boxing's not there. She won't. Boxing. Dude, boxing was the move. That was the one right there. Nobody could beat my sister. Not a single person. At I've boxing? never seen her lose at Wii Boxing. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm sure once they add... I th- that'll probably be one of the next ones. Co- the sword fighting one, the one you mentioned before, that was another Wii Sports Resort one. But that, that that's lame compared to what you can do with boxing. I never played Wii Sports Resort, so I'm excited to try this out. Yeah, it'll be, it's live service, man. They'll update it for probably a long time. People love Wii Sports, and... I'm I'm sad that the switch that I have in my household is a switch light, which is unusable for this kind of game. So gonna be gonna be very sad looking at all the other kids having fun out of my sad window when that comes out. Hey, I'll be right in there with you, Seamus. The I'm a Nintendo list boy as well. Ah. We'll play your Super Nintendo while all the other people are out there with their Switches. Speaking of, the Miis in this look really weird, right? Oh, God, yeah. I don't even know. Are they considered Miis? Like, is they, are there Miis in the Switch anyway? Or is this, like, the first time Miis are here? I think there are because you, like, create them for your profile. Yeah, that's what I thought. So these are just, like, yeah. Wii Sports has their own proprietary weirdos you play as instead. <laughs> I think that should be the name of this podcast, Proprietary Weirdos. Proprietary Weirdos? Oh, that's pretty good. That's a segment in like three weeks, guaranteed. But finally, uh, let's move on to our last piece of news here. There's a huge controversy. This is this is beyond entertainment news, I would argue at this point. Neil Young, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Joni Mitchell, and lots of other artists and podcasters are pulling their content from Spotify over Spotify's continued support of Joe Rogan's podcast and his anti-vaccination misinformation campaign. It's a big movement right now. David Crosby, I know, has been tweeting a lot about, like, to him, it's not even about demanding that Spotify take Rogan off. It's about the fact that he doesn't want to be on a platform that's proud to bolster and defend Rogan as much as you could. Also, there's been all this Rogan nonsense where they removed, like, 70 episodes where he says the N-word or something crazy. 70 episodes? 70, Seamus. Oh, goodness gracious. I I mean, that's been, like, a thing in the last couple of years of, like, you know, seasons of television will be missing an episode or two because of some antiquated racial jokes, but 70 episodes is a lot of content. His, mm-hmm. his episodes are like three hours long, too. That's like, that's a lot. Almost our entire catalog would be 70 yeah. episodes. If we lost 70 episodes, Seamus, that'd be insane. We'd be nothing. 
I know after the last Rogan streaming hullabaloo where what, what was it he got like booted from apple podcasts and he like got a haven in spotify and now he got kicked off of somewhere didn't he i don't know i try not to pay that much attention to joe rogan he is a very problematic figure i don't know what to say about him really besides that i think he has a lot more like weird protection from spotify that i thought he would considering that i you know you only mentioned a few but a lot a lot of creators are standing up for this specifically and i i don't know which side of it is gonna like crack before the other one does because joe rogan is also for as controversial as he is he is so popular for his show specifically and i think that there's gonna be a lot of weird standoffishness for a while until somebody kind of folds here the only person that can stop a bad guy with a podcast is a good girl with a guitar and some twang that she lost a few (laughs) albums ago um which we'll talk about later in our pop culture reference of the episode i think and it will stay confusing until then (laughs) (laughs) i think let's go ahead and move on to our main segment uncharted games one and two For today's main segment, we're going to be talking about the first two games in the Uncharted series, Uncharted Drake's Fortune and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, both available originally for the PlayStation 3 as individual games, and then later as part of the PS4 remaster, Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection, which can also be purchased and played on PlayStation 5, which is how Seamus and I have been revisiting them lately, though I think both of us originally played them on PlayStation 3. Yeah, for sure. I remember playing the first, what was it? I guess it would have been the first two games when the third game was coming out because the third game looked so cool to me and I was like, well, I gotta get the backstory here. And then I like marathon played through both of them all the way back on the old PS3 days. So it wasn't until probably Uncharted 4 came out that I went back around again and did the Nathan Drake collection, which at that point had been out for a little bit. Well, I literally purchased the Nathan Drake collection like two weeks ago because you, when you talk about the good old PS3 days for me, that was like a year and a half ago still. So (laughs) right. Yeah. I, I forget that you've just recently caught up to us. I'm relatively new to the franchise considering like how long it's been out really, because I got my PlayStation Mm. three in 2016 One of the very first games I bought for it was Uncharted 3, because to me, video games had never been something where I had to play them in order. Like, I jumped into the Gears of War series when I had my Xbox right in the middle of it. I always felt like video game numbers didn't matter. It was just the new Call of Duty, the new whatever, you know? I can kind of get where you're coming from. I was about to say that sounds insane, but kind of the way that a lot of major series, at least, have gone for so long... You're right. It was just kind of like, all right, pick up the new one this year and it'll be kind of a new, its own thing. So I started Uncharted 3, like that was one of the first games I started on my PlayStation 3. I was immediately like, oh, this is like a story. This is like a movie. And I was (laughs) digging it a lot. I liked it a lot. And I'll talk more about it next week um, when we talk Uncharted 3 and 4. But I was like, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to wait until I can play the other two. And I remember, like, after I came to college, I picked up one and two at Mega Media Exchange for, like, a buck a piece and played them through, and it was fantastic. Also, I want to express my shock now that I realize that the Nathan Drake collection probably should be in the PS Plus collection, right? I mean, like, it's kind of, if not the one, definitely one of the few, like, PlayStation mascots, I would say, is, like, the Uncharted series. Uncharted 4 is in the PS Plus collection. And it is my understanding that the function of the PS Plus collection is to be the definitive PS4 games that you can then play oh, yeah, with backwards compatibility on your PS5. I guess that's fair. That's probably assuming more that you had that extra time to catch up on the original three. They also gave it away their first days of play right when the pandemic hit, when they gave away Ratchet and Clank and Horizon this year. What they gave away when the pandemic first hit was the Uncharted Nathan Drake collection. Oh, right on. Yeah, I do remember that. I think I had mine from way back in the day in just a regular PlayStation Plus monthly free drop. That was just like a really good month. What are your thoughts in general, Seamus? Obviously, I've touched on 
the fact that clearly I came late but really enjoy them. Like, give me your general thoughts on the Uncharted franchise before we kind of break down the game by game stuff. It's very Indiana Jones, you know? We're both separately, we were both Indiana Jones kids, weren't we? Like, oh, did you watch those? Absolutely. Fairly young, probably maybe a little too young to be watching an archaeologist, like, blow the brains out of a Nazi in, like, the desert. You're like, oh, wow, that's pretty intense. But it's just, like, the quintessential kind of adventure feeling in all of that. And what Uncharted was to me when I first started playing them was definitely the only, really, to this day, unless I can think of something spontaneously out of the back of my memory, the only video games that kind of scratch that true adventure itch. You know, it's the most adventure any kind of adventure can be. I mean, maybe it is because it checks a lot of those Indiana Jones boxes in pretty much every single game, in a lot of the characters and situations, but there's just something about them. All all four of them, I mean, I haven't played The Golden Abyss, even though I'd love to, and I haven't played The Lost Legacy, but I'm sure they keep pace. It's just the perfect mix of, like, smart, clever dialogue, uh, characters you genuinely like, situations that are definitely unique, but familiar enough to be like, all right, here we go, we're Indiana Jones in it right now. And that that happens very consistently throughout every one of these games, and... Even though I will say that the first game, Drake's Fortune, is, you know, very, very rough in a lot of ways, gameplay-wise, pacing, you know, I still think that it's truly very fun, very iconic. I, I equate that first one a lot to the first Assassin's Creed game, you know, just like totally amazing in setting up a lot of what would make everything else totally way better. And maybe way too clunky to start. And that's also why I didn't replay too much of that first one for this episode. I kind of stuck to the Among Thieves for, for a lot of my replay stuff. Well, I think in order to give one its fair due, we have to go through them, like, each sure, individually. Yeah, sure. Or else we'll only talk about Uncharted 2. Fair enough. Naughty Dog has always been very upfront about the fact that the two biggest influences on the franchise were Indiana Jones and National Treasure. And I think that's super evident in the story and gameplay. Mm. To me, and especially because I was not super familiar with, with AAA titles, modern AAA titles, when I started playing the Uncharted games, they are the closest I have ever, ever felt to playing a movie. And that is mm -hmm. not to, like, knock video games as an art form. That's not me saying that Uncharted is the best game or the best series I've ever played, because I think... Like, God of War, I think, is objectively a better experience overall because it's it's really good with story and with sure. gameplay in a way that Uncharted, the gameplay, is almost cursory to me. Mm. It's about the experience. It's about the feeling, the adventure feeling that you were describing earlier of you get to be an action hero. You're in it with characters that you love. I really do care as much about the characters in the Uncharted series as I do a series like National Treasure or Mission mm -hmm. Impossible. I also feel like we would be remiss to talk about, even though we talked about this in our Firefly episode, how transparent the influence of Firefly is <laughs> on this franchise. Oh, yes. Greg Edmondson, who did the soundtrack for the first three games, is, of course, the guy who did all of the music for Firefly. Not to mention the fact that Nathan Drake is so clearly Nathan Fillion. I mean, like, mo modeled after pretty much and clothed very similarly and attitude, quippiness. Yeah, it's it's all really there. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Nathan Fillion do that short film? Oh, that fantastic fan film that's probably better than the new Uncharted movie. Yeah, go check. That if you've not fantastic seen... fantastic fan film that I have never seen, so this is directly to me, actually. Yeah, you need to go. That's not really a rec center, but, like, go watch it. It's just fantastic. I'm going to watch that on the premiere day of the new Uncharted movie, I think. That'll instead. be good. I think that'll, that'll be, be good. that'll please the Uncharted gods in a way and maybe we'll maybe we'll get something out of that. I also do want to give Nolan North his due because I do think he really does make the character his own. It's not like it's just him doing a Nathan Fillion impression. It's so much of why we care about Nathan Drake is because of how Nolan North has that attitude in his voice and the delivery and timing 
on all of this, uh, you know, well-written story. It's absolutely incredible. And it also, I, I've definitely brought up my weird, I'm like so many seasons deep into that stupid Pretty Little Liars show. And I just figured <laughs> out that Nolan North is one of the main characters and I barely realized what? it. And I, he's, yeah, he's the dad of one of the main four girls of the show. That's insane. And he's like so connected. And for five damn, let me tell you, Garrett, for five seasons, I was like, why, what have I seen this guy in? Because that's what I was going with. I was like, he's so familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. And I was a big dum dumb because it was his voice, his beautiful oh. Nathan Drake voice of his should we oh, let's let's go ahead and break in uncharted drake's fortune spoiler thoughts i guess we kind of put our non-spoilery thoughts that's out true. there you're right the, as a whole so yeah, let's just yeah let's just yeah. jump into to drake's fortune nostalgic for sure is a, is a big word but also very uh clunky mechanically i have a lot of memories of just like in our intro fully nose diving into the ocean and just like bottomless pits over and over with that first one but that oh. was also Assassin's Creed that was kind of any game back in those early PS3 days where you got to climb on a wall the game is pretty much like you want to know where to go next idiot figure it out <laughs> you know definitely definitely the climbing also- is not intuitive and it's really pretty clunky the gunplay is fine but there's too much of it oh yeah like you're just sitting there and it's just wave after wave of these guys (laughs) in the jungle but the stuff that hits in this game really really hits and there's a reason that it spawned the franchise that it did those first like three missions are incredible what a way to open a video game because you go from starting off with these three main characters nate drake who's our adventurer sully the wisecracking mentor, older playboy figure, and Best character in the franchise. Oh, what a man! And finally, Elena, who is this smart, savvy, ambitious journalist who's along for the ride. It starts out really, really well with this like Jaws under the ocean with the mysterious mm. quote from Francis Drake. You fight pirates, you get in the plane, you go. You ditch Elena. You're in the jungle. You find the U-boat on a waterfall. Ugh, I mean, iconic. It's so fantastic. It gives you immediately what you're looking for. And I think this game pretty much gets worse as it goes. <laughs> in terms of, it gives you really memorable, exciting stuff at the very beginning. It gives you really good character interactions at the very beginning. There's the whole temple with, like, the the really light puzzle solving. Because the puzzle solving in especially one is just egregiously simple, I think. Yeah, it really, it's just like turning something at 90 degrees until a door unlocks. And you don't even have to figure that out yourself. It's literally just in the notebook that you have in your pocket. But I think the characters and the tone and the, the visuals, I was playing the Nathan Drake collection, but... This game is 15 years old, and it looks fantastic. It Mm. looks so good. Totally. I I will say that that upkeep through the Nathan Drake collection and probably with the the locked 60 frames on our PS5s that we're playing on, I think it is truly a definitive experience if you're going to go for, like, all the way through that first one. It's definitely a good way to do it. Because once you get to the island, really, it's kind of boring. Uh, I think for a lot of it. I like, yeah. uh, what is it, Eddie Rojas, the yeah, mercenary sure. guy who you're kind of frenemies with. I think he's a great character. Football I like his it. life, Ro- Danny Rojas. <laughs> he's the Football. real villain. I like it when Elena breaks you out. That moment also to me really sums up the series and shows the promise that it has where Eddie Rojas is intimidating you in the jail cell and all of a sudden you see Elena clumsily trying to hook the tow cable <laughs> around the bar of your window. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is ge- genuinely very great stuff, and I, I totally agree with you that it's like it, it fires you up right away this game, and then it's a lot of just being in the jungle doing gunfights. That's my main memory of the first one. It's it's a lot of this the jungle, and that's which, why which I is think... a shame because there's so much stuff that's cool in it that's not that, but there's so much of it that is that that it's all yeah. you remember. I will say another, it's a lot of the jungle, and then my a boom, immediate next memory is those cool, scary monster guys, oh. which is another huge part of this franchise that is, 
of course, still very Indiana Jones-ish, but it go it kind of turns it up a couple notches for sure. Something I want to express, 2008 gave us two games, Uncharted, Drake's Fortune, and Call of Duty World at War, where Nolan North is running around an abandoned Nazi oh facility God. with an MP40 while Nazi zombies chase him around while he tries to get the power on. That is absolutely insane, and it is kind of news to me that Nolan North is Dempsey? Nolan North is Richthofen. What? <laughs> That's an even bigger twist out of all of this. That's wild. Yeah. He's great. He's got range. That's also wild that I didn't also realize that both of those came out in the same year. That year, for me, was dominated by World at War, apparently, because I, I, it took me years to catch up on Uncharted, so <laughs> that was still kind of fresh for me. I don't know. I like these weird... Until Dawn, Wendigo, Nazi, disease, monster guys, oh, you know? They're very so freaky. cool. Totally, totally. They're by far the most memorable enemies in the game because the villains, um, Navarro and the <laughs> rich guy whose name I can't remember. Yeah, the rich guy from Too Fast, Too Furious. Just, you know, you know, <laughs> out there somewhere. <laughs> uh, he's coming back, don't worry. <laughs> he's, he's coming for Roman, Seamus. But yeah, it it's not good villains navarro is marginally more interesting uh, I, I mean i can remember his name especially because like he's the final boss uncharted i'll say this in general i don't think the boss fights are very good i don't think there's ever been one that is super satisfying to me even sure, uncharted I, 4 I, which i think by far has the best gameplay in the series i think the boss fights may be the worst part of that game i feel that yeah it's a lot of what you were saying before, a lot of that, like, it is like playing a movie in so many ways, and it's a lot of how the feel of those gameplay mechanics in action are, and, you know, the way the camera moves, and the, the moves, the uh, hand-to-hand combat that flows really well with, like, the run-and-gun stuff, and that definitely loses a lot when you get into the boss fights, especially when they're, like, very scripty boss fights, and it's kind of just like a, a button mash ender, where you just gotta, like, kind of wail on somebody for a while. Well- I remember Not playing the best. this game the first time. You're on a boat. Navarro's got Elena. Fight your way through three waves of guys to get to Navarro. And it is just merciless. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. so hard for no reason other than the fact that it's the end, <laughs> so it's supposed to be hard. They just, they just juice it for you, just so you just bullet hell everything. And then, uh, like you said, the of course, the last thing that happens in the game, the last bit of gameplay, is a quick time event. It's literally like you press square to shoot Navarro, or or, or no, you you loop him through the helicopter as it falls off the right, boat. Yeah, but it's just yeah, yeah, it it's all about the story for me. Uncharted One because I love these characters, and it's a stupid pulpy little like one dimensional version of what Uncharted will eventually become. But it's still memorable and exciting and fun enough to hook you immediately. Yeah, I would say it's it's on par with a lot of other things in 2008. Like you said, it's a it's the proto version of what will become very famous and world renowned and selling millions of copies and spawning franchises and spinoffs and HD remasters. But that first one is a rough one for sure. My dad has considered, and I'll talk about this more when we get to Uncharted 2, uh, my dad has kind of thought about foraying into gaming with the Uncharted games because I think they huh. appeal to him enough that he might try it, but I definitely would be like, here is a 15-minute video of the cutscenes that matter and <laughs> skip the first one because... Oh, yeah. Unless you're serious about it... really having that experience, I don't think it's worth playing through it. But it is worth Yeah, it'll, it'll turn people off, I would say. Yeah, story's fantastic. It's iconic in so many ways. All that Victor Sullivan juicy mustache loveliness is is all up in there and all the quips you could handle, but I think your pop would probably be pretty frustrated with a lot of that stuff. Like, my dad can't figure out how to turn the camera on Disney Infinity, so I'm trying to picture him doing the platforming (laughs) in this game. Oh my god, yeah. Being able to map out a hanging wall route up a thing as things crumble behind it. Yeah, it's it's a lot to do with the old stuff. This is the only one also that doesn't mark your climbing spots yellow for you. It's just like, 
you'll figure it out. It's somewhere on the wall. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's either a texture yeah. line or it's a real line of a handhold, and you, you're going to find out which one it is when you jump. It's Russian roulette with handholds on a cliff wall that, granted, looks pretty good for, like you said, a 50-year-old game, but... Not that good. Still really hard. I do want to talk about the standout sequence that we haven't brought up yet, which was the impetus for the gameplay style of the rest of the Uncharted series. There is a bit where you're climbing around on a waterfall, which is pretty cool. This jeep pulls up with a machine gun and is just shooting at you. Mm -hmm. And it has gas barrels in the back and you have to shoot the gas barrels and the jeep explodes and you have to like dodge it and run out of the way in time to get up away before it blows up and that is a great sequence and i remember watching interviews with amy hennig who was the creative director on these first three games where she talks about how that's the feeling of like oh i can really impact the environment create these cinematic Hmm. moments myself that they were trying to capture when they went into two three and four man yeah I i remember exactly what sequence you're talking about too because it is such a important point that like there were other games at that time still that like felt like big and open but it felt more important that you could explore the environment in ways like that to kind of figure things out a little more smart a little more puzzly on the shooting part and granted again like you said it kind of influenced the future of it and a lot more puzzly things were an influence on the shooting mechanics and, and moments but a lot of that it was buried under waves of enemies around the, those cool iconic moments in that first one. But I think if we're going to talk about the extrapolation of this series, we got to start talking about Uncharted 2, which at the time I played it, I yes. think was my favorite game of all time. For good reason, because that game is kick-ass in so many ways. Whenever I replay it, I often think of it as like Temple of Doom and Raiders had a baby. It's It has those weird Temple of Doom vibes going back to Indiana Jones and stuff, but it is like maybe the best in the series in a lot of ways. It's story, gameplay, in terms of the upgrades from that first one and just like itself uh, standing alone. It's It's just so, so much fun. So yeah, we're officially in Uncharted 2 spoiler territory, just to make that abundantly clear. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I definitely think that this is the most quintessential Uncharted experience, in that it is just fantastic, the feeling is there, the cast is better than ever. Most people point to Uncharted 4 as the best in the series, and I'm probably inclined to agree with them. But I think Uncharted 2 has the most stuff that I really come to Uncharted 4, by which I mean... The train sequence is... Yeah, the train! I do not hold up Uncharted 2 as the best game I've ever played any longer. I do maybe hold up the train sequence as the best single level in a video game I've ever played. It's so fluid. It just goes straight back to that, like, it's like playing a movie. Unlike something like, say, a Quantic Dream game, like Detroit Become Human, is maybe more literally you are influencing like a dynamic cutscene, like a movie, but it's it's just being in that the that train sequence is so fluidly, beautifully well done, built around just feeling like your own independent Nathan Drake, Indiana Jones, badass. It's it's so good. And with the cold open tease of that too, is, is so, so well done. I really, really wish I could go back and play Uncharted 2 when it came out. Like, oh yeah. The idea of experiencing that just cold for the first time. <laughs> yeah, you in media res, hanging off the side of that cliff in that train, running out of it as it falls over it's again it's just a quintessential adventure scenario i love the macguffin in this one oh I, yeah the, the the dagger thing yeah chloe is a fantastic addition to the cast i think as his oh, friend, hell yeah who is really really fun and i always want to call billy because he reminds me of the character called billy from jurassic park 3 and i don't know why <laughs> But he does. Um, I do not know that. I, it's been a while since I've seen Jurassic Park 3. I apologize. Billy, you know he's going to betray you the second you meet him in the game. But oh yeah, that's inconsequential. Because again, Uncharted, you are there for the vibe. You are there for the characters. You're there for the ride. It doesn't matter if you know mm. 
this guy is going to betray you. <laughs> Before we move away from the amazing new characters in the second one, I just want to quickly highlight and shout out my boy Jeff, who does not, who did not deserve to go out like oh, that. My boy I, Jeff the cameraman. I had a whole thing, Seamus. Don't worry, I'm ready to go <laughs> in. Because that sequence, do you remember what country you're in in that sequence? Pretty sure you're in Nepal still. You're like in the streets. I am obsessed with that whole sequence of you and Chloe fighting your way through the city streets and then running into Elena and Jeff. That moment, really, when I was playing it, got me as excited as the train sequence did. But it's because I care about the characters and love watching them interact so much. And when Chloe showed up in game two, I was like, oh, we've just got, it's like Bond. Or Indiana Jones, we've just got oh, a you, new You mean a Elena new when she shows up with Jeff? No, when Chloe shows up at the beginning, I was like, okay, so we've got a oh, new love oh, interest. Oh, right, yes, 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 yes. And then later when Elena shows up, I was like, oh, this is like a real sequel, huh? Like this is, you know, we've got <laughs> Elena back. And I think constantly when Chloe goes, who's this? And Elena's like, I'm last year's model. And I just think uh, that's so funny. Totally. It gives you so much information about their backstory it's kind of a meta commentary on the game and the genre as a whole (laughs) it lets you know about who elena is as a character her sense of humor but yeah i love jeff i think (laughs) jeff's death is super impactful for how little screen time or game time whatever it's called Mm. he's given jeff's death is what sold my dad watching out of the corner of his eye (laughs) watching me play uncharted 2 on like oh like this is a movie and I want to watch it and I want to know what the characters are like because I was playing Uncharted 2 during the pandemic actually Mm -hmm. I had my PS3 down in the family room during the course of me playing Uncharted 2 I got a TV up in my room and so I moved the PS3 up to my room and I finished Uncharted 2 my dad was like well I really would have liked to been there for that (laughs) I think I think your dad might be really trying to get in on the Uncharted's man you're like we really got to get him sat down with, I think he's got to go through trial by fire, start with the first one. He's really got to earn it. But once he gets to two, man, it's going to be all worth it. I think two of the greatest side characters in this franchise are Jeff and Tenzin. And Tenzin. Oh, Tenzin. Yeah. We haven't love even him. talked about yet. Who's in, who's in the Tibetan village. Yeah. Once um, they finally get up into the mountains there. We're looking for Shangri-La in this one. We're looking for El Dorado in the last one. Oh yeah. We barely talked about that. Because it doesn't yeah. matter. That's not what these games are about. I mean, it, it, they're they're truly MacGuffins in this game. The city oh, yeah. is just the thing you're going for. And I will say this for two specifically, is that Uncharted Two I think is the one that makes the most best use out of its history. I think it really milks a lot mm. out of the real history and the real world cultures that are involved in the plot of its treasure of its city, and it feels well researched it feels like you're immersed in that world and i really appreciate that because four kind of does its own thing and it kind of runs it takes the baseline of the pirate history and Mm. runs with its own thing three is just if lawrence of arabia and last crusade had an underwhelming baby (laughs) um and one barely has any real history in it so like two is really i think the sweet spot for it yeah i can get behind that I i definitely see what you mean there also i am just now learning that Schaefer, the the German fellow the German fellow who you meet in Tenzin's village, mm. is Rene Abergenois, like acclaimed character actor, Rene Abergenois. Who what was that person in? Um, you know, the bartender from McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Um <laughs> I do? Uh, I guess he, I actually do. He's the chef in the Little Mermaid, he was <laughs> he was in the Mash movie. He was a Robert Altman regular. He just slipped in there as as our boy. Uh, he was a Nazi in this, right? Ex Nazi yeah, scientist. Well, he friend. but like he he didn't want to be a Nazi or right, something. Right, right, right. We're getting towards the mountains again, and and Schaefer and stuff. The like Yeti folk, the the guardians yeah. in this game. Lots of fun. Big fan of the supernatural. Or I guess extra natural. How do you even say something like that? It's well, like, it is technically natural in this game. It's but... bizarre. The whole thing is they're yetis, right? And the yetis are stalking you with Tenzin uh-huh. through, through the mountains. And then you kill one. 
and then you take off its mask, and it's like a man. It's like true Scooby Doo time. Yeah, but You're then like, you really learn good. still that they are like they're eating the Chintamani like, stone <laughs> stuff, the sap. So yeah, like super soldier so, yeti so tribe they're still guys. Basically superheroes. Yeah. They're not yetis, but they're basically something as scary and as weird as yetis. Yeah, it's a weird mask reveal when the thing is still like weird underneath. But you know, I still enjoyed the idea that the first one is strictly about let's get this golden idol. And this one's about like Let's definitely get this giant sapphire, I think is what they think it is originally. And then it's like, oh no, it's winter soldier juice and we're going to really get all of this war criminals buddies up on this stuff. And it's kind of, they do the opposite of what they did in the first game where it's originally all about the gold. And then I think someone at the end wants to sell it as like a bioweapon. And then this one's the old switcheroo on that in general. The plot, it does make more sense in this one. Lazarevich is the guy yeah. who Flynn is working for, who is slightly more interesting than the generic rich guy from the first movie. Not the first movie, the first game. <laughs> See, look at me. Oh, uh, it's going to be a f- movie franchise soon enough, Garrett. Soon Don't enough. you worry. I think him killing Jeff really mm. does make him way more intimidating. Like that, I, he, I think so, too. It elevates it, for sure. He definitely teeters on, like mustache twirlingly evil bad guy because he's supposed to be like he's like a mentally deranged war criminal who's like on the run from nato or whatever and i'm like all right this guy's so over the top evil bond villain but then he gets you know killing jeff makes it so personal and that he's not just a crazy War criminal, he's the crazy war criminal criminal that killed my friend Jeff, all right? We're going to go yeah. stop him. We're going to get that sap away from his big bald head, and we're going to shoot him. We're going to make him get torn apart by Guardian guys at the end when he's juiced up on the sauce. And <laughs> I think Flynn is the best villain in the entire franchise by a really? lot. Really? Hot take. Who do you, is it a who hot do you take? think Hold is on. better? I was going to say, is that even a hot take? Because I do, I like him... He's fun to have as a bad guy. He's a fun on-screen, pleasantly hateable, not over the top in a lot of other ways like the guy in 4 is. We'll get to him. We'll get to Rafe. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, you might be right on that. I think he's uh, like fun to battle it out with. The, What's his the, death? How does he die again? Lazarvich either shoots him or maybe leaves him for dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. After you find the Chintamani Stone... He, like, stumbles in, bleeding to death, and I think even Elena tries to help him. Good guy moment. He, like, unpins a grenade and yeah, lets it like explode. Into the flammable, explosive sap or whatever that you've been fighting with. Like, fatally wounds Elena, uh, nearly. Right, yeah. Chloe, who is, I will say, I think the weakest point of this game is the fact that Chloe is written so poorly that she's just is switching sides constantly. Yeah, she definitely, she's got so much potential up top, and then it slowly turns into just like a, all right, this is the NPC for your mission until the end of it, when she's like, I'll go check on ahead. And then it's just like, she's then pointing a gun at you yeah. at the end. At the end of her arc, obviously her choice is like, I'm going to stay with Elena and help her because I, because I care about her. And that's like a good arc for her to have. Mm-hmm. And then you go off and you fight Lazarevich in what is... Probably my favorite boss battle in the entire franchise, yes. even though it's way too long. You have to shoot the stupid <laughs> sap like 15 oh my times. God. You just said exactly what I was thinking before when you brought up the boss fights. I was like, oop, I'm going to wait until we bring up this one because it's actually, you know, it's a fun arena. There's, he's, you know, like I said, he's juiced up on the, the, se- the nectar and, um, you got to, like, run around and, like, run and gun a lot of, like, keeping him at a distance. But it is so long. It takes forever. The fact that it is that long makes it insanely hard, or at least the last time I played, I remember it taking me, like, a thousand tries to finally get him down. And I was only playing on, like, normal mode. So it's a little drawn out, but still very epic in that ending with, like, you know, what happens to him and Flynn coming in and all that stuff. Puzzle solving in this game, way better. Platforming in this game huge improvement the ai is really good on the on the enemies compared to the Mm -hmm. last game we didn't even talk about the whole stealth mission up top where you and flynn are infiltrating the istanbul museum oh no yeah that was that's a lot of fun i know there's you know some similar similar stuff to that in the third game but this one was definitely 
it's very well paced. Sometimes the stealth missions in these games get a little long for me, but this one was very well paced, and you know they give you the little trank gun halfway through to spice it up. It's, just, it's a lot of fun. I think there are a couple of moments in that sequence which I actually replayed right before we uh we started recording. Mm-hmm. Where it still definitely has the problem of, oh, you don't know where to go? You're going to jump and fall to your death? Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if they add in more enemies because of this, but I was replaying this second one on... It's not the hardest mode, but it's the one before that. The one you have to play to unlock the hardest mode. And I'm doing it on, like, a speedrun timer... And there are so many guards in that museum for some reason. I don't know. Ugh. Ugh. It's insane. The Uncharted games are games that I love enough to platinum, except for the fact that they are too impossible to platinum and I will never do it. <laughs> My buddy Colin, he... I think he did the first one, and he's in the middle of the second one, but you have to, like, glitch out the game and, like, put the disc in, but don't install the update file so that you can exploit things that you can like drop through three chapters and and like keep your time it's like a lot of stuff like that and that's what keeps me away from a platinum that's like you know fun anymore exactly insanity but yeah uncharted 2 i don't think we've honestly been singing its praises properly enough i think it's just incredible how modern and cool and fresh this game feels for a game that's as old as it is i also think it has just an incredibly satisfying story. If I went and saw Uncharted 2 as a movie, it would be like my favorite movie of that year, probably. Don't don't give Tom Holland any ideas, man. He'll do it. You oh. know he'll do it. Here's my pitch, Seamus, when it comes out on streaming cheaply. We'll cover it for the show. But before we cover it for the show, we crack out your Vita and we play Golden Abyss. Yes! Yes, sir. I agree with that. That and maybe uh, Lost Legacy. I've always been interested in the Lost Legacy. I know zilch about it, and I'd be into it. My only thing with Lost Legacy is, and it's not a problem at all, because I have Legacy of Thieves collection now. We'll be talking about that more next week. But I don't want to play it yet because I want to wait. I think realistically they will make more Uncharted games because I think it's too profitable a property not to, especially with the movie coming out. Oh, sure. But as far as I'm aware, this is the last Uncharted game. And it's the last one I'll ever play for the first time. And I'm like, I want to save it until I am itching so much for an Uncharted fix. You are, like, rationing your Uncharted content. That's honestly pretty smart. You know, you could probably at least get through most of the original four and, like, get all the uh, treasures or something before you you have the need for new content, you know? I think Uncharted, for me, is so much about the narrative experience. I enjoy rewatch or I enjoy replaying them. Again, I say I'm talking about them like movies. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy replaying them, but I think it's all about that experience of the first time you're, like, mm. really going through it. You're like, whoa, this is crazy, when you're on the train and you realize that you have to shoot the bolts on the straps to make the log fall off the car so that the big heavy machine gun guy who thank goodness they didn't bring back for any of the sequels (laughs) um falls off because oh my goodness the bit at the end where you're running around the temple the tibetan temple and you have to like rocket launch those guys and it's impossible and i just want to stop playing the game (laughs) I know exactly what you're talking about. Again, it's not it's not that they're making it harder by making it harder. They're making har- it harder by making it impossible. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It's very, very, very weird. Final thoughts on the first two Uncharted games, Seamus. Very fun. Play the second one. I think they are PlayStation classics for a reason. And, you know, at least, like, 66% of that... Nathan Drake collection is like pretty golden altogether. That's pretty good. The majority of everything that we're saying is positive about all of those games, yeah. regardless of how clunky the older ones may feel. They are classics, and I'll we'll definitely replay them for years to come. E- even though I skipped over the first one this time around because I just recently replayed it, and you can't play it again. You can't that do quickly. it to yourself too <laughs> can't, often. Can't, you gotta, you gotta have a cool down time. A little Uncharted 2 in there first, but... Completely agree. These are games I hold very dear to my heart. Uncharted 2, I still would put in probably my top 10 favorite games. 
Mm. I think that's it's a good. That's good. I agree. It's really a fantastic story, fantastic characters. It feels so globe trotting and so satisfying. Mm-hmm. The structure is perfect. The gameplay is so fun. It's showing you everything that a game can be. I think in a way, like Uncharted ushered in the modern era of gaming and i think really the game that truly took it into like the modern era was uncharted 2 i think the Mm. impact it's had on gaming the legacy it's had on gaming still is being felt because i think in a lot of ways most triple a games most third person adventure games that are triple a are trying to be uncharted 2 and they'll never achieve that level of perfect harmony, I don't think, because that game is, it's on a pedestal for a reason. It is so damn good. And even comparing it to, like, later Naughty Dog stuff, when you get into, like, The Last of Us games, it's that realism versus that cinematic quality that just makes you, it makes your heart flutter when you're playing it. It's just pure action movie bliss in every way. It's, it's fantastic. So yeah, tune in next week for our thoughts on Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception, and Uncharted 4, A Thief's End. But for now, let's kick it on over to our reference this week. This week's pop culture reference is Taylor Swift's relationship with Spotify. Around the 2014 release of her fifth album, 1989, Taylor Swift engaged in a public standoff with Spotify over artist compensation and music distribution. Swift initially published an essay in the Wall Street Journal, often referred to as the Spotify Letter, where she called Spotify out for their royalty system and platform in general. Swift stated, Music is art, and art is important and rare. Important, rare things are valuable. Valuable things should be paid for. She then pulled her entire back catalog from Spotify, reinstating it three years later as a thank you to her fans after 1989 sold 10 million copies. Spotify pushed back against Swift's statements, issuing derogatory ad campaigns and playlists. Additionally, Spotify boss Jim Anderson was quoted as saying that Spotify was built as a platform to distribute music, not pay artists. As shown by the recent movement by artists to use their distribution on Spotify as a way to have their social opinions heard, Swift's letter can be seen as an early example of the power an artist can wield against large media corporations. Recently, David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and vocal opponent to the retention of Joe Rogan's content on Spotify, said publicly that Taylor Swift would be a valuable source of information on the current protests regarding the streaming platform, as, quote, she is the only one who has successfully kicked Spotify's ass. And David Crosby is right. It's incredible how much of this controversy from almost a decade ago is super Mm. relevant to what's happening right now. Because we're not only talking about artists pulling their content to make a political or social statement. Part of the conversation with Joe Rogan is how people are compensated and the fact that Mm. pulling your thing from Spotify isn't really hurting an artist that much monetarily. It's only hurting them in the ability to reach people because... I mean, Taylor Swift, a big part of her argument was the fact that it's not sustainable to have every single song at your fingertips essentially for free. Fully catching back up in real time. And, you know, I think it's very interesting that David Crosby has kind of put the call out to to Taylor to, you know, help them in some way or give advice, publicly support in some way. I think it would be interesting one way or the other, considering that she now, like we said before, she had her music reinstated onto Spotify a couple of years after the letter itself went public. So I would be very interested to see what she would have to say about something like this. But I think now let's move on to Save the Rec Center. Now it's time to Save the Rec Center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. Garrett, what do you got this week for us? As we talked about at the top of the show, Oscar nominations came out. The film with the most nominations is Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog. I watched this recently over break with my mother. It's a Netflix original film, so you can watch it right now. One of the most tense movies I have watched in years It has so much character depth. I think it is going to really garner multiple rewatches from me, even though I've only seen it the once as of now. Mm. It has fantastic 
from its four leads, which are Benedict Cumberbatch, Jesse Plemons, Kirsten Dunst, and Cody Smith McPhee, who I've been a fan of all the way back since Slow West with Michael Fassbender back in like 2015. Mm. All four of them nominated for Academy Awards, all four of them certainly deserving. It is an unhinged, horrific, intimate, sad, sweet look at life on the American frontier in the early 1900s. I am just in awe of it. It was one of my favorite movies, if maybe not my favorite movie of last year. And I'm glad to see it getting so much recognition from the Academy because I really am a fan. Yeah, man, I'd love to check that out sometime. Is it, wait, where, where can I find that one again? Netflix. It's a Netflix original. Hell yeah, that is good to know that it's so easy to access, and I will definitely try to hit that one up before the Oscars, whenever they actually are. I don't actually know when they are, but... Uh, end of March. That's gonna, that Okay, that's on my list before the end of March, for sure, because you've definitely talked it up. That and West Side Story, I respect the hell out of your opinion, so I gotta get those under my belt. But what do you got, Seamus? This week, I have been listening to the band Daisy pretty much nonstop every day. They have, like... 15 or 16 songs on Spotify, so it's just been kind of a pleasant loop. I've never heard of them at all before until Kara found them on her, like, recommended uh, songs list, and it has been one of the most refreshing, like, modern bands that I've stumbled upon in a long time. It's this weird genre-bending sound. It's very, like, fractured, jazzy R&B pop. It's kind of a weird descriptor when I when I try to say it out loud, but it's, it's just, like, very, very good and fast drums, incredible vocals from the front lady, uh, Daisy Hamill Bufa. I do not think I'm probably saying that right, but... She is absolutely incredibly killer. I would definitely recommend checking them out just for the fact that they're, like, good for any kind of mood. A lot of their music kind of shifts in and out of, like, super high energy and then kind of, like, smooths it out into a very more slow jazz breakdown in a lot of their songs. And it's kind of just very auditorily pleasant in a lot of different ways and i would listen to a million different versions of their songs but they've only got a few out there so definitely check it out show them some love a lot of what you said is super interesting to me so yeah next time i'm over at your place i'm gonna pop them on the old sound bar and you can just kind of groove to it because it is it is grooving music man let me tell you it's dancey and chill at the same time it's like i said hard to explain with words but i'm I'm gonna play it for you next time i'm over you'll you'll get it that's jazz for you exactly exactly but i think that wraps up our show this week if you want to reach us on social media you You can find us at PCR underscore podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can reach the show directly by reaching out to popculturereferencepod at gmail.com with any questions or comments about the show that you hear. And you can follow us both independently on social media, Twitters, Instagrams, I don't have one of those personally, or Letterboxd as well. Join us next week for more Uncharted goodies. All right, let's get out of here. Let's go play Uncharted 4. Yeah, let's do it. That sounds great to me. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos.